Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist's Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. This month's episode is sponsored by Dysel Arbor Biosciences, Beckman Culture Life Sciences, and PHC Corporation of North America. Dysel Arbor Biosciences, previously known as Arbor Biosciences, is a development and manufacturing company that delivers cost-effective, user-friendly products to researchers of genetics and plant sciences. They routinely collaborate with customers and research partners to develop innovative solutions to address unique applications. Beckman Culture Life Sciences is a trusted worldwide resource for tools to help optimize research and manufacturing efficiency. Their centrifuges, particle counters and analyzers, automated liquid handlers, flow cytometers, and many more products improve the productivity of dedicated scientists, quality control experts, and others. PHC Corporation of North America markets a comprehensive line of laboratory equipment under the PHCBI brand. Products include space-saving and energy-efficient VIP Eco, Twin Guard, and VIP Series ultra-low temperature freezers, cryogenic and biomedical freezers, vaccine, pharmacy, and high-performance refrigerators, cell culture CO2 and multi-gas incubators, and Drosophila and plant growth chambers. As the COVID-19 pandemic spread across the world, universities closed, academic laboratories shut down, and researchers wondered how they could help. Many scientists donated masks and other personal protective equipment to aid in the fight. But when those were depleted, they turned to what they had left in their arsenal, their scientific expertise. In this month's episode, we discuss how one synthetic biologist pivoted his research to join the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Tiffany Garbutt from the Scientist's Creative Services team spoke with Michael Jewett, Walter P. Murphy Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering in the McCormick School of Engineering, and director of the Center for Synthetic Biology at Northwestern University to learn more. Synthetic biology is an emerging discipline where scientists re-engineer parts of living systems to accomplish new tasks. By harnessing the natural building machinery of the living world, scientists create new biological systems to address a number of societal needs. Michael Jewett is passionate about using the tools of synthetic biology to create equitable solutions for public health emergencies. He believes that synthetic biology is uniquely poised to enable low-cost, portable, and easy-to-use healthcare solutions for global challenges. Across the globe, more than 2 billion people lack access to clean water. I mean, that's an amazing number, right? 2 billion people lack access to clean water. And so I think we as synthetic biologists have been trying to imagine how can we repurpose the molecular machinery of this cell that is already used by cells to sense and respond and interact with their environment to tell us whether or not our water is safe to drink. In many places, from Flint, Michigan in the United States to resource-limited settings across the globe, officials need to test drinking water for heavy metals, arsenic, or other hazardous compounds. However, existing water quality diagnostics are expensive and time-consuming. Scientists must send a sample to a centralized testing facility, which can take up to a week to return results. Jewett and his colleagues at Northwestern University used a branch of synthetic biology called cell-free synthetic biology to engineer a portable, inexpensive water quality test that provides results in as little as 10 to 15 minutes. So cell-free systems, I would really say, are a part of synthetic biology. They really focus to engineer biological systems, but do so without living intact cells. Um, So you can kind of think of this like we take living organisms, we take off their cell walls, and we collect the insides of the cell. And then we learn how to um, harness and control the molecular machinery of that cell to do useful things. So as an analogy, it's kind of like we take a car and you lift the hood up on the car and you can pull the engine out um, and you can kind of then play with it. And so I kind of like draw parallels to thinking about cell-free systems in that light, because what we're really doing is, is kind of playing with the engine of cells, but doing so in a way that we don't have to worry about evolutionary objectives that have arisen over time for cells. So as an example, as a synthetic biologist, I might be interested in engineering a living organism to produce a sustainable carpet. Uh, let's say E. coli, which is a gut microbe, or I might be interested in 
in developing a yeast cell that can produce insulin very inexpensively. Well, the, the truth is E. coli or any other organism isn't really evolutionarily optimized to produce a sustainable carpet. Um, and yeast really doesn't want to make insulin for us. In fact, they've developed evolutionary objectives over time that are oftentimes actually diametrically opposed to those engineering uh, foci. And so what happens when we try to engineer living organisms is we end up having this tug of war that exists between what cells might want to do and what we as engineers want to do. And I think that's where cell-free systems come in. So cell-free systems try to eliminate this tug of war um, by being able to take the molecular machinery out of the living organism and then use that without living intact cells, without the evolutionary kind of baggage of the cell to harness the machinery for exactly whatever the engineer wants to do. And so for me, that's really kind of one of the exciting elements of cell-free systems is that we kind of get to separate cellular objectives from engineering objectives. Jewett and his collaborators at Northwestern University stripped the cell walls from E. coli and collected the gooey intermolecular components of the cell to create a biological sensor. One key component of the extracted cellular machinery was allosteric transcription factors. Cells evolved allosteric transcription factors over millions of years to recognize and bind to small molecules like fluoride or heavy metals. If a heavy metal is present, they bind to it, allowing the cell to produce a protein to react to their environment. Jewett and his team repurposed this natural sensing machinery to detect hazardous compounds in drinking water. They engineered their biological sensor to produce a colored protein in the presence of heavy metals. They then freeze-dried the molecular components of their biological sensor and embedded them into a piece of paper. With a simple addition of water, the molecular machinery from the cell reactivates, setting off an engineered chain reaction that senses hazardous chemicals in the water and releases a colometric output that can be observed with the naked eye. Within a matter of minutes, with limited resources, testers will know if their water is safe to drink. And then, you know, what's really... Um remarkable about everything that's happened in the last, you know, six to nine months as the COVID pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has, has moved its way across the globe is that, you know, it turns out this is affecting not just 2 billion people, but the entire planet. And, and so we wondered really if it was possible to try to pivot or think about how these same types of cell-free diagnostic systems that otherwise we've been developing for kind of field deployable um, water quality testing could be used, in fact, to, to detect the virus. Allosteric transcription factors evolved to detect small molecules, not RNA sequences from pathogens. While they were well-suited for water quality testing, Jewett needed to find another type of cellular machinery specialized for sensing RNA to create a diagnostic test for COVID-19. He and his collaborators turned to CRISPR-based technology. In bacteria, the CRISPR-Cas complex is part of an adaptive immune system response that recognizes short segments of invading RNA, typically from phage, and triggers cleavage mechanisms to destroy intruding phage viruses. Scientists harnessed this technology for genome editing a few years ago, but genome editing is not the only research application of CRISPR. Scientists have since discovered other CRISPR proteins that can be used to detect disease. Much like genome editing applications, CRISPR-based pathogen detection relies on guide RNA. Researchers create short specific segments of guide RNA corresponding to viral RNA sequences and pair them with a detection enzyme and a reporter. If the CRISPR-associated Cas proteins are shepherded by the guide RNA to detect its corresponding viral RNA, the Cas enzyme activates to initiate a cascade that generates a color metric output. Similar to the water quality diagnostic test, Jewett freeze-dried and embedded his cell-free CRISPR-based biosensor for SARS-CoV-2 onto a piece of paper or a test strip, similar to a pregnancy test. The cell-free components would become reactivated by the liquid in a patient's saliva to provide results in just 15 to 30 minutes. So what's, what's crazy about the whole system is that you need to be able to not only have the viral genome become accessible from the sample itself, but then have the biochemical machinery of the CRISPR system, essentially these CRISPR biosensors, to be able to specifically recognize the viral genome alone and not anything else in the sample, such that it's turned on and leads to a visible signal. 
But this really captures one of the essence and amazing elements of biological systems is that they can be so specific. Not only are cell-free systems specific, but they are also stable. Based on Jewett's preliminary experiments, freeze-dried components of this enzymatic machinery can be successfully reactivated after being stored for 30 days at 37 degrees Celsius, approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And I think that provides hope, really, that we could imagine. And I, you know, it leads me to be an optimist that we can actually create freeze-dried cell-free systems that can be distributed, right? That can be manufactured, that can be distributed to the point of need where they need to be used, and then they will still be able to act as your detection system once there. Jewett and his team continue to experiment with our technology to see if they can detect traces of SARS-CoV-2 in the environment, on desks, in air filters, or even in wastewater. They would like to develop a global surveillance system to track the spread of the current pandemic and monitor for resurgences of the virus. I'm most excited about uh, the diagnostic work that we're pursuing, uh, in part because I think diagnostics and having better diagnostics will be transformative so, for so many aspects of our daily lives. And in addition, it's really a fun project because it's actually combining more than 20 people from the Center for Synthetic Biology at Northwestern, all working together across multiple PIs and students. And I think that that has brought a real sense of purpose to, in particular, our graduate students and postdocs in this time and uh, value of the, the potential impact that they can have. Jewett's biological sensor shows promise for rapidly detecting SARS-CoV-2 because the extracted molecular machinery enables more streamlined biochemistry, but also because it does not require sending the sample to a separate centralized facility for processing. The COVID-19 pandemic highlights a limitation of laboratory-based testing. It, it doesn't scale with a sudden and dramatic increase in volume. So laboratory tests, despite that's what we're using right now, um, especially those, for example, based on quantitative PCR or others, they require time, equipment, expertise, infrastructure. Um, and just this leads to a whole lot of logistical challenges and ultimately has caused, at least in, in our country, you know, inadequate ability to test across the entire population, right? And, and I think what that's motivated is a need to develop more easy-to-use systems, ones that might not require the costs, the equipment, the infrastructure, the centralized testing um, that we currently have. And so I think we and many others are, are really focused on trying to think about how to contribute with the tools that we have. Jewett's team is currently planning new ways to decentralize diagnostic testing, and they have also developed ideas for decentralizing the manufacturing of protein-based medicines. It costs hundreds to millions of dollars to build manufacturing facilities and maintain refrigerated supply chains that produce and move medicines across the country and abroad. One of the things my lab is really keen to make an impact in is the creation of equitable biotechnologies that allow us to be able to move some of the synthetic biology technologies that we and others have been creating into and across the globe. So we've been trying to address this gap in my research laboratory and others using and creating portable on-demand biomanufacturing processes where we're now not using sensors, but we're actually trying to make medicine. Pathogenic bacteria have sugar-like structures that decorate their surfaces and act like bacterial fingerprints. To train the immune system to recognize pathogenic bacteria, Jewett and his team stripped the sugars from the surface of pathogenic bacteria and conjugated them to a protein that the immune system readily recognizes. The goal was to teach the immune system to recognize different parts of the pathogen. Some scientists use a similar approach for developing vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. However, rather than developing vaccines, Jewett's team focuses on improving their manufacture. I think the other direction that I'm really excited about is just the utilization of cell-free protein synthesis systems to accelerate the time to market for antiviral medicines that can neutralize the virus. Because I think it just has this, it's poised to have an impact and save people's lives. Like everyone else, I'd love to have a vaccine, and I, I'm optimistic that that's coming. Um, but our work in the context of vaccine development 
has been more on thinking about principles that can enable uh, vaccines rather than developing them ourselves. Currently, manufacturing medicines is a lengthy process that often involves transfecting mammalian cell lines with a plasmid containing a genetic sequence for a gene of interest or a potential therapeutic. Scientists grow and screen these cells for protein expression over the course of weeks. They later screen individual cell lines for stability and productivity and expand them in large batches. The entire process can take 18 months or more. With cell-free systems, scientists do not need to transform candidate therapeutics into cell lines and wait for the cells to grow. Rather than using the entire intact cell, scientists extract the molecular machinery of the cell that synthesizes proteins and use it to make medicines. This streamlines the biochemistry and cuts the total manufacturing time down to just two to three months. Using this technology, synthetic biologists can rapidly produce candidate vaccines and protein-based antivirals for downstream testing. In a proof-of-principle experiment, Jude and his collaborators at the Shanghai Tech University in China developed a single one-pot cell-free system to generate large quantities of valinomycin, a small molecule peptide with potential for treating COVID-19. Jewett's team used cell-free expression systems to express valinomycin and then combined the reaction with cell-free metabolic enzymes to mass-produce the small molecule in a single cell-free system. Using this approach, they improved the production of valinomycin by approximately 5,000-fold. What we wanted to demonstrate was that the cell-free approach could be used as a strategy to accelerate biological design and to basically increase the pace of research that could lead to new types of medicines. One of the things that, that I'm excited about in terms of synthetic biology is I think it's helping us have more shots on goal. It's allowing us to have more shots on goal than we would have, you know, a decade ago or years ago um, for creating neutralizing antiviral proteins. It's allowing us to accelerate. The, I mean, it's it's ridiculous when you think about it, how fast the vaccine development timelines have been compared to what they historically are for vaccines um, and just how much the scientific community has mobilized across academia, across national laboratories, across industry. Um, and I think that speaks a lot to the emergence and the coming of age of the tools of synthetic biology. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Tiffany Garbutt. And thank you again to Dysel Arbor Biosciences, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, and PHC Corporation of North America for sponsoring this episode. For more fascinating science, check out The Scientist's Lab Talk, a special edition podcast where we explore topics at the leading edge of innovative research. Please join us next month as we discuss how researchers use modern genetic techniques, including CRISPR-based gene editing screens, to improve cancer immunotherapy. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.